Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for being with us today and welcome to this SOAS webinar on open source verification. I'd just like to remind you all this event is being recorded and it will be published on the SOAS YouTube channel sometime after the event. Um, my name is Henrietta Wilson. I am so pleased and privileged to have had the chance to work on this project on open source verification alongside such fantastic colleagues, uh, Dan Plesch and Alamide Samuel, uh, who've been absolutely instrumental in, in, in getting the research going and also for making sure these webinars happen from a technical point of view. All the publicity and all the behind the scenes stuff is thanks to them and to the scrap volunteers. Um, we have got five amazing panellists today, and I'm extremely grateful to all of them. We've got Melissa Hannan from the Open Nuclear Network and Dateo. Uh, we have Alan Hill from Ridgeway. We have Hans Christensen from the Federation of American Scientists. Benjamin Strick, who works with all sorts of organisations, and I'm going to take BBC, Bellingcat, EU Arms Project as some of them, because that's what he lists on LinkedIn. And we also have Nathaniel Raymond from Yale University. It's a great honor that they've all been able to join us. Um, before I hand over to the speakers, uh, I'm going to just give some short introductory remarks, clarifying what these webinars are all about uh, and where we're we going with them. So to start with, our definition of open source verification is all monitoring that relies on publicly available tools and data. So it's often associated with technologies. Uh, in recent years, it's really come under a banner that's more typically called open source intelligence or OSINT, implying uh, use, of, use of data from satellites or social media and, and lots of different technologies to crunch and access the data. Uh, and our definition of open source verification definitely captures those sorts of activities. But it captures more than that. It captures activities that were happening before these technologies were invented. Uh, so there's a, there's a huge invitation with our definition to remember that monitoring traditional media is also important. Building communities of verification practitioners is really important to generating good results. Uh, so this is the seventh in a series of webinars that have been really aiming to, to showcase the diversity of open source work that's happening around the world. Uh, and I'm really pleased that it's done that, that um, we, over, the, over the seven webinars we've had, uh, we've had 28 speakers representing an enormous range of tools, methods, backgrounds of practitioners, and also the sorts of things that people are monitoring. So we've uh, had people who are monitoring human rights abuses, political violence, environmental issues, uh, and weapons technologies. So a really big range of stuff. And we're really mindful uh, that there are enormous synergies and overlaps between different monitoring systems. Um, uh, so it's great that we've got such diversity. However, you know, it's, it's only right to point out this is the tip of the iceberg. In my research conversations that have led to these webinars, I've engaged with a lot more people from many different places. And as we go forward with our project, we'll be really aiming to capture more and more of the, of the diversity of this field. Um, so the so seventh webinar is also the last in the series for now. Um, and so I want to say a few words very quickly about what next in our work. Well, uh, we've had a number of, of requests for community building activities. Um, and in the very first instance, what we're going to do, which we've mentioned in the invitation to this event, we're going to run a virtual cafe, a chance for people to get to know each other through very short, uh, small conversations. And the first one of those is going to be on the 10th of December. Uh, so please save that date. We'll be sending more details about it soon. We're also working on an edited volume and various other research uh, 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 spin-offs from the work. Um, so moving us back to actually what we're going to do today, uh, we're going to have uh, five short talks from this fantastic panel. Uh, we're starting with some introductory talks from Nathaniel Raymond from Yale uh, and moving then through the order of speakers that I mentioned. Throughout the session, please do feel free to raise questions or comments via the chat function. Um, I'll be fielding those and putting them to speakers um, as and when we can. And then later on, um, I'll invite people, after all the talks are finished, I'll invite people to raise their questions and comments via their video and audio functions. Um, so thank you very much. 
Uh, I'll hand over now to you, Nathaniel. Thank you for being with us. Thanks so much, Henrietta. It's a real honor to be here and to talk to you all. Uh, I want to uh, do three things in the uh, time I have to speak to you today. Uh, one, talk about what's not new in terms of the, the current moment um, in the OSINT field. I want to talk about what is new, and then um, I want to talk about how I think 2020 is going to be a really important year for this emerging area of practice and, and to orient why 2020, I think, is going to be uh, into 2021 is going to be a very important six to 12 months coming up. Um, first, just some, some background. Uh, I was uh, formerly the director uh, of operations for the Satellite Sentinel Project, uh, founded by George Clooney uh, in 2010 um, at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative uh, at the Harvard School of Public Health. And that, that work led to the founding of the Signal Program on Human Security and Technology at uh, Harvard in 2012, which led to uh, the first, uh, to my knowledge, um, satellite imagery, geospatial methods, and open source uh, class uh, in the United States, uh, which we taught for, for several years at Harvard before I came here to Yale. Um, I just wanted to give that, that background um, as a launching pad for talking about what's not new um, <laughs> in our discussion today. Uh, for me, uh, I'm generally uninterested in technology. Um, and never really wanted uh, to have anything to do with it. Um, I was a human rights investigator, a war crimes investigator, beginning in uh, 1999 at Physicians for Human Rights as part of uh, the forensic team that Physicians for Human Rights uh, ran for the United Nations Office uh, for the High Commissioner um, for Human Rights. And my, my sort of doorway into investigations uh, was the 2001 Dashti Laili massacre in Northern Afghanistan. And by way, way of uh, background, um, I started working in uh, around 2008 with satellite imagery with Lars Bromley of the American Association for the Advancement of Science and Stefan Schmidt from our forensic team to try to determine um, where this mass grave we had been investigating um, had gone because it got stolen. And so my, my entry into um, open source investigations was entirely accidental and was um, out of desperation and necessity. Um, satellite imagery and these other methods came in because our traditional scientific methods, um, such as on the ground forensics and DNA didn't work so hot when all your evidence had been taken by a warlord. Uh, so uh, for me, in that moment, working with the New York Times, with the American Association for the Advancement of Science, with forensic professionals, um, we began to see the potential promise of these methods, not only for retrospective forensic investigation, but for prospective. Um, and what I mean by that is we could begin to uh, basically set up collections of imagery, collections of open source information with the idea of trying to detect perpetrators of gross human rights abuses before they had committed their crimes. And so this is the first part, what's not new? The journey of professionalization that you all are part of now is a journey of professionalization of every single type of forensic science ever. That is not new. Uh, if we look back at ballistics, at fingerprinting, at the use of mitochondrial nuclear DNA in human rights investigations, of the application of physical anthropology to human rights investigations, the, the process of maturation um, is pretty predictable. Um, the, the first question is, how do we know that we know what we know? <laughs> um, <laughs> how do we begin to establish um, a theory of forensics specific to the individual streams 
we are bringing to our analysis and most importantly to the variability that comes when we fuse streams together through mosaicing. Um, that's a, a problem in physical forensics. It is a problem in digital forensics. And the bad news is that it never goes away. Uh, <laughs> uh, the, the, the second piece of professionalization is who's qualified to do this work? How do we determine? Um, what Do we need certification? Uh, how do we review our work? And then most critically, um, what are the limits? We talk a lot about the opportunity in OSINT, but as with any emerging field, the question is, what are our limitations? Um, when do these methods um, inject more risk into analysis than solutions? And how do we measure that? So the takeaway from this first part, um, is that it is an interdisciplinary process of multiple fields to professionalize a means of forensic inquiry. Um, and it always is, it, regardless of whether we're talking OSINT or back to the previous antecedents in terms of uh, DNA analysis, et cetera, it will be a combination of practitioners, a combination of academic researchers, a combination of governments and standard setters, and it will involve uh, the intersection of technical standard, legal, and ethical. Um, so let's talk about what's new. What's new is that the potential right now um, to rapidly fuse data um, is unprecedented and will only continue to grow. And we must constantly, as professionals in OSINT, um, look at the double-edged nature of the burgeoning availability of open source data, open source methods and tools. The double-edged sword here is we have an incredible um, and growing opportunity uh, to be in the game, to be involved. And that gives us an incredible and growing opportunity to screw up. Um, <laughs> and I think for me, um, the, one of the missing gaps in the, the growing visibility and integration of OSINT methods into traditional media, such as here in the United States, the New York Times and the Washington Post have open source investigative units. Um, we are seeing it increasingly taught. We teach it here at Yale. Um, what's missing is a scholarly pedagogy to capture where we make mistakes. And going back to my experience with Satellite Sentinel is that we have, I think, failed um, from the beginning to create safe spaces and academically rigorous spaces to share um, uh, where we screw up. In, in the case of Satellite Sentinel, we identified about, I think, six or seven alleged mass grave sites through a combination of uh, imagery and ground data and witness data. I would say about three to four of those would stand up to academic scrutiny or review now. Um, how do we begin to develop a peer review system that allows us to capture critical incidents, to capture where we fail. Um, capturing our failure in this field is the only way it will grow and mature. Um, capturing failure requires us to create uh, basically standards um, of review and venues for review. And so that's why events like this make me so excited because What's new now is that the stakes are higher and higher. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was involved with the Washington Post on investigation of the Sednaya prison in Syria and apparent evidence of mass execution at that prison. And what really, um, for me, why I bring it up is that it was a success. Uh, we were able to combine multiple pieces of evidence together 
and to both um, review and debunk some previous reporting, including reporting by the United States government, and to fuse together the reporting of others to build on the corpus of evidence. Uh, the problem with that moment is that we never got to capture and publish our methods. And so both for failure, looking back at mass grave typing, I wish we hadn't done <laughs> in Satellite Sentinel, and looking at the Sedna example, we see the missing gap of right now is that we are focused on technology rather than pedagogy. And so let's talk about, and I will wrap up, I'm rambling here, um, why the end of 2020 into 2021, I think is gonna be so important. Um, you may have heard here in the United States, we have a new presidential administration coming. Um, it is very clear that um, there will be policy steps by the Biden administration, by Congress, likely in the next six months, that will probably uh, address um, issues related to open source investigations and to professionalization of open source investigations, including um, if you've read the recent Human Rights Watch report, um, I, I think it's called Video Not Available or Video Not Found um, on uh, the takedown of data by social media companies. Uh, I think that we, we have a moment in the next three to six months for action by the incoming administration um, in conjunction with platforms to begin to develop mechanisms uh, to retain retrospectively and proactively um, social media data relevant to evidence of gross human rights abuses. Uh, I think, unfortunately, U.S. internet policy and U.S. social media policy uh, is de facto, in many ways, global internet and social media policy. Uh, I think uh, we have a moment with the new administration where we might be able to use an American football analogy, uh, my apologies, um, uh, for American football metaphors, um, to get first down. Um, it may not be a touchdown, but it will be a step forward. And so the challenge I have for, for you all is to think about um, what in the European and in the British context, what governments can do on your side to support you in your professionalization. Um, what if we could talk to governments and ask for partnership in the professionalization of this field, whether it's evidence retention, whether it is investments in uh, forensic standard development um, within one jurisdiction or across jurisdiction, whether it's training of law enforcement um, or other professionals, lawyers, bar associations in these methods, working for judicial standards and educating um, huge need within the ICC and the ICJ, educating jurists in admissibility in chain of custody. Um, now's the time where we need to take this from a hobby or a subfield into an increasingly accepted part of uh, modern forensics and modern investigations. Um, so that's the challenge. I think what will probably happen on the U.S. side is we will see an opportunity building on the U.S. example um, for there to be um, a best practice about how governments may start to engage um, in formalizing and enfranchising evidence retention um, as part of standards. So with that, I will um, shut my trap, as we say in the United States. Thanks for having me. Um, I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a, a great webinar. Nathaniel, thank you so much. What a fantastic starting point for this uh, webinar. You've given us a really uh, a detailed idea of the opportunities of this sector, some of the real things that you've achieved and more generally what's possible uh, throughout. And also you've clearly laid out the challenges to it. Uh, and I really appreciate 
the immediacy uh, of, of, of the frame that you put on that in terms of what's happening uh, in US politics right now. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to remind everybody, please do make comments uh, via, or questions via the chat function if you have any, but seeing as we've got such a full panel, I'm going to hand straight over uh, to Melissa Hannan now, uh, who is from the Open Nuclear Network and Dateo. Uh, thank you very much, Melissa. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to Professor Raymond for really giving a broad overview. I'm actually going to now dive really deep into a very small slice. Um, the Dateo project is a project that just turned two years old yesterday, and it is a community. It is a repository for data that may or may not live on the internet anymore. And uh, we are trying to address some of the ethical and pedagogical issues that Professor Raymond already mentioned, but we're not perfect. Uh, we're very young, uh, we're funded, but uh, not infinitely so. And it means that um, we're meeting a lot of these challenges in real time. So I'll give you a very brief overview. And then I think in the question section, if you wanna have any specific questions about how we're operating or facing these challenges, then we can go more deeply. So we have um, three factors that we try to combine in one place. Data fusion is, is the, our primary goal. As Professor Raymond already mentioned, this is uh, the, uh, the value add that we see today. So we collect data sets from all over. Some of these are purchased from commercial providers and some of these are scraped if that is in within the terms of service of the website. Um, some of this is contributed by volunteers uh, and others are from our own employees. Uh, the users of Dateo we consider to be a distributed network of talent. These can be people who volunteer their time, uh, people who are maybe in school and are trying to learn skills experientially. Uh, some of our uh, members are domain experts already. Some of them are journalists or even panelists on this very panel. <laughs> and some of them are data scientists or other kinds of technologists who are trying to learn how to do data visualization rather than the subject matter itself. Um, on top of that, we are our third leg is machine learning and mechanical Turk work. Um, this is the maybe the leg that's lagging a bit right now. So we uh, do put out missions where we ask our users to do work for us uh, to build training data sets that we can use for object detection. Um, we should have sentiment analysis up next month and uh, some other um, Services are already up uh, like topic uh, modeling and other services using algorithms that are already in existence that we did not build, but which we link back to from their original repository, GitHub or whatever. And we digitize documents, um, videos, uh, photos, other types of information and tag it so that it's more usable. Our goal is to enable these kinds of actors, uh, civil society, journalists, governments, and those working on treaty compliance. And that's because we're primarily focused on arms control issues, uh, particularly nuclear weapons. Uh, the exceptions to this is that, of course, we have to follow US, EU, and UN sanctions uh, regulations. And uh, we also have to follow um, export control regulations. So because we have data sets, including satellite imagery, for example, um, we have to make sure we don't accidentally export those to a user who may use them for purposes that are sanctioned. And we also have to make sure that we do not have users from certain sanctioned countries or uh, individuals who are the, they themselves sanctioned. So we have a system of automated and human vetting in order to join Dateo um, if you apply. Our goal is to have increased security for everyone. Uh, we believe that a better intelligence product is mated in a more uh, diverse uh, 
uh, innovative way. So where information has historically been very siloed, perhaps not even shareable within a government, let alone with someone who you, you may view as an adversary. Our goal is to collect purely open source information with a variety of users of different expertise, uh, different um, capabilities, languages, not local knowledge. And um, by that increase uh, the nature of the conversation that's happening around arms control to be more informed. Um, we're hoping that um, these informed conversations will ultimately lead to uh, letting off steam before a conflict turns into a nuclear armed conflict. That's our hypothesis. Um, we're also very aware that there is increasingly a a have and have not situation that's happening, not only among intelligence groups uh, that are identified by governments, but also in open source. So I come from a university background where my university could afford expensive data sets, and that is how I learned. But the bar for new talent, new capability is set too high for the average person to learn. Um, I think I tweeted out that I learned using Google Earth, and that is a true story and a pretty rare story because most of the people in open source on the nuclear weapons beat uh, come from intelligence backgrounds. And there's a very few people who have moved from intelligence to open source and perhaps shared that which is allowable. Um, but this new wave of those people who have only owned in, open source backgrounds is, is growing. Um, some of the capabilities we have in detail include imagery analysis. Uh, a lot of the space is just called workspaces. So this is an example of the map workspace where users can uh, look at imagery, satellite imagery, as well as points, lines, and polygons that may be useful. So this is actually of uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base where a user can turn on notices to airmen to look for signs that there may be a hazard for airlines, a civilian or military aircraft to be wary of. Uh, this allows you to maybe identify different places you wanna look, and then you can search for satellite imagery as well. Uh, as you can see, there's a social component, so users can talk to each other and um, they can also uh, make identifications uh, by annotating themselves. Uh, this is pretty much free form in this area, but we do bring all the sources, algorithms, data, and user comments with you so that if you decide to actually share this to our internal gallery, then all those sources come with you. And this allows us to kind of keep um, track of what data, what sources, and what individual works on each project. We have some photo forensic tools. So I don't know how many of you are fans of um, military cats, but uh, we have some very beginning um, ELA analysis and metadata extraction that's allowable here to give you a chance to see that not only cats, but all the, all the various military officials have their medals polished up as well in, in these images. Um, you upload your own photo uh, to check them and it will not be shared with the rest of the group, although the admins of the site uh, will see it. We have scanned documents. Some of this is good for your own edification and learning. Um, I put up those documents that I found to be very helpful to me in learning how to identify overhead imagery or ground photos and other kinds of things. But we also have scanned documents that are uh, not optically character recognized yet. We apply optical character recognition to them, which makes them more searchable by text. You can comment on the documents, you can comment on images inside the documents, and you can have discussions about them. We have not yet done any machine learning on this, but this is an area where we hope to have a lot of analysis. We have done machine learning on quite a few text data sets that are already in text format. So Korean Central News Agency has been in text format uh, since late 1997. We collect all these different data sets and we allow you to view them not only as text, 
but also in a graph format if that is what you choose. And in this case, you can see when we applied the LDA uh, algorithm for topic modeling, and it's you can link back and look under the hood if that's something you're interested in. The top 10 topics are identified by the size, and the one I've highlighted here in red is related to DPR nuclear military war force. So I know that this is a topic that is very prevalent in North Korean state media, and then I can do additional sentiment analysis on that. And if you're interested in reading about it, we've got an article up on the front page of Detail, the, the public facing page by Dr. Clayton Bessaw, who works with us. And uh, you can read more about that topic. We do have videos. Thanks to Scott LaFoy, we received over 40,000 North Korean videos. Um, this is because Google uh, has been taking them down due to risks, uh, perceived risks of sanction violations because obviously on YouTube, you do earn some income um, from advertising. So um, I think many of us in the crowd probably know that Syrian videos are coming down, other kinds of videos are coming down. So we wanted to uh, host homeless videos or videos before they go homeless here. Um, all the audio of the video is transcribed into text format, making them searchable. And um, very shortly, that text format will go to our graphing workspace so that you can do topic modeling, network analysis, and so on uh, on the video uh, transcript as well. You can annotate videos by dropping a box in the video and writing a comment. Um, and similarly, uh, you could comment on the bottom of the video if you want to have a discussion with someone. Um, if you're able to make a visualization you like, then you can save it to our gallery and other users can comment on them and, and make different types of uh, discussions available. Uh, all of this has to stay behind our password protection because of our licensing agreements with different data sets. So while this is a useful tool uh, behind the wall, it's not fully public. And that's primarily because of the legal ramifications of doing so. Um, I think I have a friend on the panel who really enjoyed this particular mission. Um, in this case, we asked users to identify surfaced air missile sites. There were about 8,000 sites that I had called together from different uh, sources uh, where we thought there could be surface to air missiles. We gave the example and then we asked users to draw a box around it if they saw it. And that's because in many instances, uh, the sites were abandoned, sand or dirt blew over them, so on and so forth. And we're trying to create a, a very good training data set for object detection. If legally allowable, we will make that object detection algorithm available on the DETAIL website so that users can search large areas of satellite imagery in order to find surface to air missiles. Um, but the new US export control law in January makes that a little bit questionable. So that is a legal question we're working on right now. This is very new um, and there isn't a lot of data or I guess an economy of points in our system, but we are trying to build reputation scores for all our users. So the more activity that you do, the more points you accrue and your reputation increases. As we build out more missions and more other types of activities, and we eventually get a baseline of, of accuracy, we will start ranking people on how accurate they are as well. Um, we want to gamify it a little bit to encourage participation, but we also hope that this may be a credential that you could say on your resume, for example, or share uh, your reputation score. My last point is I do want to talk about the larger organization. Detail is a tool inside of Open Nuclear Network. You can find us online, and we have built a code of ethics. Um, this was after several meetings with the Stanley Center. Uh, in the United States where we um, openly described some of the internal ethical de decisions that we were facing and um, found a lot of other people, including Hans, who's on the panel, um, also were trying to work through um, how we handle some of these dilemmas. And so we've done our best effort at describing our code of ethics. 
Uh, this is our public facing document. We also are working on an internal document, which is more describing how we handle employees as they face these different ethical dilemmas. Um, so like an enforce, enforcement mechanisms. Um, I'd be very happy to get feedback on this because um, other than modeling on journalism, we, we didn't have a lot of inputs. And so this is an area where we're still developing. So thank you very much for having me and I look forward to your questions. Uh, thank you, Melissa. A really, really fantastic follow-up to Nathaniel's giving us all sorts of very rich de detail about how you do it, how, how, how Dateo does it, but also a sense of what an open source researcher does. We have had a question uh, in for you from Dan asking about how, how scalable these things are, but uh, if it's okay with everybody, I'm going to ask him to ask it in person from you um, after all the talks, uh, uh, so we can get uh, so give you a chance to think about it, and also so we can move uh, through the speakers. Uh, I was really interested by the comments that you made um, around some of the vulnerabilities of the data being lost, and Nathaniel also made similar points. And I'm just putting it out there: this isn't a question; it's a kind of comment that it feels very much as though there's a sort of porous quality between what's closed and what's open. And something that has been open can become closed again, and what has been closed can become open. Uh, so I, we've, we've explored this a bit through other webinars, and I'm just interested to see these themes coming up again. But I will now uh, move uh, the floor on to uh, Alan Hill, please, um, from Ridgeway. Um, oh, <laughs> uh, if that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm moving through alphabetically by surname today. That's how I've done it today. So uh, over to you, Alan, please. Thank you, Henrietta. Yeah. Let me just sort that this out. Uh... Is it sharing okay? Cool. Let me just yes, that's going. great. Thank you. Uh... Okay, I'm just going through the slides. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alan Hill. I'm the operations and technical manager for Ridgeway Information. Uh, we are spin out from King's College London. We've gone a few years now, and mainly what we look into is non proliferation. And other things we start to look at now is the wider ranging sort of non proliferation, chemical weapons, and other subjects. I'm going to go through this last year. Uh, we were tasked. Uh, Conduct known source research into some historical chemical attacks in Syria. This is for a, a particular client. And on top of that, I thought, you know, this is probably a good opportunity to have a look, do something else and try a test case. And this probably falls into what Henry, um, Liss was talking about, as well as Nathaniel, about data being lost. And this becomes quite important in the open source world because if we lose that data, how are we going to use that to formulate our assessments and things like that? <coughs> We've become, after this become more pertinent now is when the conflict in Syria is ongoing. Most information that's out there about atrocities, war crimes is still in the open source domain and we need to make sure we retain that and use it for future use. Okay, so just the outline of the task is, as most things, identify the objectives, collect original online data and information, which I'll cover in more detail, conduct the cold case review and compare results. So identify the objectives themselves. So the main things we want to look at is collect what original data and information is still available online. Okay, so as in now, this one of the attacks, particularly one we looked at was 2017, was very interested in how much information was still available and how much information we could still use. Then conduct a cold case review of the attack using only the original data and information available now. So look, we're looking three years previously Using that information, would we come up with the same sort of assessment? And then compare the data results and provide an initial assessment itself. This was on the sideline to another project. So we're doing this in this sort of the wings just to see and prove the concept. So do apologize, there are maybe a few images on there that are quite adver adverse. Okay, but this is when we start to look at all the information and collect all the original online data. This becomes when it becomes more problematic because some of the attacks, they become 
secondary reporting, they become fake news, and it's just trying to get into the weeds of the initial information. And actually, that's what you want when you're doing your open source investigation, you want the primary source detail, primary, primary source data. So issues we have with the data collection is ideally as well, identification of that primary data. You want that initial data. You don't want the secondary report. You don't want the BBC News. You want the data from the ground. So that's going to give you the best insight. And then we start to look at identify other data sources. There are other data sources that are already reported on these, but we didn't want to have any bias, preconception of any issues and information that was gained, but we would use them, actually use them and use their sources. Then we start to find use OPCW reports and find all their sources, uh, Syrian Archive, the NGOs, news organizations, and investigators as a benchmark. Because one thing we didn't have is a benchmark to say, right, is the information still the same as it was in 2017? And this is when we start to look at, we hard, it's hard to gauge how much loss of data we have over this period of time, over these three years. Because you think, if, if we lost it, if it's lost, we can't use it. And when you're an open source investigator and doing your research, you want to say, you want, you want to make sure you've got all the data available at hand. And this is, when you actually become new to this, when you come to a new conflict, new area, is understanding the reliability of the data and the sources. How reliable is it? Can you use it? Is the source credible? All these sort of things are gained over time. It's hard to do this straight away and trying to gain that sort of reliability. And one thing, especially looking at conflict zones, is adverse nature of material. You look at conflict in Syria and, and ISIS and what's going on in Yemen and around the world, there is a lot of adverse nature of material. And you've got to think about your researchers, your investigators, the people doing this work, the amount of information they're looking at or the adverse material looking at over time, that's going to have an adverse effect on them. So you've got to think, right, you've got to monitor that and make sure they've got the welfare support in there when they're doing it. So once we get all the information together and we have maybe 200, 300 pieces of data, we start to go through them all. And you have to review, verify, and assess all the original data collected. So every piece of data, we would go through a stringent process of reviewing it, <coughs> verifying it, and assessing it. And I'm sure Benjamin, after the, after the, in my talk, will go on to how he does that sort of thing. Is your thing. So every piece of data we've got to go through it into finite detail and extract all the information we can from it. What I tried to do as well is with any bias, any unconscious bias people have, any preconceived ideas people have about this attack as well. So we're going it afresh to have a clear mind. So any previous knowledge and opinion in the review was removed. So we didn't look at any OPCW reports, didn't look at any Bellingcat reports, any other reporting to try and have them so we had a clear and unconscious view. One thing I'm, I'm always adamant about with my team is be objective and critical of the data. Be objective. Always go into these things open mind. Okay. Don't have a preconceived idea. Be objective. What, what information can you see? What does it tell you? Go through the what, the who, the where, the when, how. And be critical of the data. Take the data apart in finite detail. Get everything you can from it. Because that way then you can determine and, and see how, how useful it is. One thing we start to create there is a timeline from the data and the information. That becomes quite important then, because when, especially when you're trying to look at the event, you're trying to piece together what's happened, what actually happened on the ground, and actually when information was posted, especially when you do an open source, something might happen at 2 p.m., but the first post doesn't go, the first image or video doesn't go out till 2.30. So there's a 30-minute window. Why is there a 30-minute window between the initial event and the information start being published on the internet. This could be down to things like internet connectivity, uh, removal of 4G connections. People actually, when things happen, people, sometimes people don't, the first thing they don't do is start recording that information and posting it online. Last year, when I was conducting a, a course with our Nexeter, as we start, as we were starting uh, the third day, the uh, Turkish invaded Syria. The, uh, along the border and actually we could watch it in live and actually understand actually this can get live information that's quite critical because then you can see it as it's happening big thing to do is identify your knowns and your unknowns what do we know what information have we got and what information can we gather don't think okay and that's when you start to clarify what you can actually know and what you don't know 
Let's be very clear about that and critical about that. I'm saying about be critical of data. What do we know? This information is right relating to this event, is it? Can we push it, put it to that event, to that location, to that time frame? And what don't we know? It's been very clear about, is there a 30 minute window between an event and it first being posted online? Why is there a 30 minute window? That's when we start to die and then fire information and our knowledge gaps. Understand where we don't have the information. We can start to think about what, what, why there's a knowledge gap, but don't start putting theory into it. Be very critical about it. What is fact and what is fiction? What do we know and what we don't know? Sorry. Then when we start to form this assessment on the available data we've got. <coughs> So all that is done independently. So all we're doing is that, and is enclosing the and the information we've gathered about that incident. So we've got there, and we start to compare the results. So we conduct the cold, cold case review assessment. So we look at that independently with all the data we've got and come up with an assessment. Is it the same assessment as previously? Do, do things any different? Okay, one thing we did start to look at, and this is one of things Nathaniel has talked about and listed on that is data loss. We actually identified we, we lost 10 to 15 percent of data that was available in 2017 to 2020. So 10 to 15 percent may not be much, but actually, it might be that critical information that's posted online, that critical video that showed a atrocity, a war crime that's been removed by the government or the social media. That's going to change your assessment straight away, especially when looking at historic information. What we do in this case and identify the loss of data had little impact on the information gaps or the assessment itself. That was only just one case. So then just to start to close it down then to so the conclusions then. The thing we start to know is conflict is going to be more prevalent on the internet and because it's going to be more prevalent there's going to be more information and data out there and it's going to be more important then to look at the data loss that can have an impact on the ability to use open source data and information so then as been alluded to earlier on today is data archive needs to be more rigorous in order to ensure data and information is available for the future because i think in the the, uh, the end of the uh, Syria conflict there's a lot more uh, people going through open source information to look at all the things that happened in the Syrian conflict and going into in more detail to see what can prove, what can use evidence, what can use as information to start to look at and start to prepare cases against these, uh, for these atrocities as well. Thank you. And that's my email address if you want to get in touch with me. Thank you, Henrietta. Great. Uh, Alan, uh, what an interesting uh, insight into uh, an analytical unpicking of what data loss looks like, how much there is and what implications it has to a study. Really, really interesting. And it'd be fascinating to know more about how representative uh, that experience is. is. Um, I am going to move us on, keep moving on through the speakers now. So I'd like to now introduce Hans Christensen, uh, please. Uh, Alan, if you could stop sharing your slides now, that would be great uh, if possible. Um, and uh, we'll hear from Hans. Okay, thanks very much. Um, plugging on the slides now, hopefully everybody can see them. Yes, um, great, thank you very much, it looks great. So great, thanks very much for, uh, for the invitation and uh, very interesting uh, briefings here, of course. Um, I really like that they touch on so many aspects of this uh, kind of work. Um, and so I'm gonna dive into you know, what we do and some of our lessons learned here um, over the years. Um, and by doing that, I will start by uh, just giving an overview of a, pro of a project here, um, sort of very briefly talk about the methodology uh, that we've been using over the decades um, and some examples of our work um, and then some lessons learned from this. And um, the Nuclear Information Project is a nuclear weapons um, nuclear arsenal uh, uh, public information project um, that tries to glean from God knows how many different sources um, what the arsenals, uh, nuclear arsenals of the world uh, are and what they and, and how they um, and how they're uh, structured and the trend and all these things. 
So this is obviously work that goes way back before there was anything called the internet, anything that was called uh, Google Earth, um, anything that was you know, called cell phones where millions of people run around and take pictures and videos all the time. Um, this work started and the methodology started way back in the 70s and early 80s. Um, and my work, uh, I'm just standing on the shoulders of giants uh, like Tom Cochran and Stan Norris and William Arkin, who were the people or some of the people who developed this methodology and dug out uh, the, the tedious work of digging out the information, trying to make sense of it uh, and, and, and so forth. So what we're trying to do, of course, is not only uh, create the best um, uh, non-classified estimate of nuclear arsenals, uh, but also, of course, explain the trends and histories, um, you know, where we're heading, um, but, but very much to empower the public debate about this, all these different categories that participate in it. And that goes for people both inside and outside. Um, and the reason is, of course, that once you have information that may not be right on the money, but it may be good enough, um, it actually also enables uh, officials to participate in a debate in a way they couldn't do before because they can't share uh, the actual uh, assessments from the intelligence community with just anyone, even within the government. Um, and a, but an important part is also to try to um, uh, counter exaggerations and hype, which is prevalent in, in the world of nuclear arsenals. We see this all the time. And right now also, of course, uh, in the debate about China and North Korea for that matter. Um, so this is a very um, vibrant uh, t a piece of work. And uh, we put this out, of course, all in the you know, public domain because I mean, the essence here is to make this information available to the public so you can use it, so you can uh, reach back in history. And, and so we produced the nuclear notebooks and the bulletin on the atomic scientists and that describe the arsenals in, you know, year in, in, uh, uh, in, in sort of fact sheets, if you will, about the nuclear uh, states and people can go back freely and use all of this information. Uh, there are no firewalls, there's no, you know, you know payment, anything. Um, it goes into the super yearbook, of course. Um, and what's unique about that is that this is a publication that is translated into a large number of languages, um, you know, Russian, Arabic, uh, Chinese, Korean, you, you know, uh, Spanish, you name it. It's, uh, it just enables information like this to get out to uh, audiences and users that otherwise might have a hard time to get access because it's not English, um, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and in some cases, it can also allow people in countries where they're not allowed to do research and write about their own nuclear arsenals to grab material from outside and say, oh, well, that's what they say out there, um, and therefore uh, can use it to have a conversation. Um, so there's a lot of information over the years, and uh, you know, we can go back to this, of course. Our methodology is not particularly sort of, um, you know, unique. I mean, it's like everybody else doing. We're looking for, for data on this and we're pouring it into uh, some sort of a prism and, and, and try to draw some conclusions based on it. And of course, there's a vast inventory of declassified documents, even official documents, uh, like public documents, and whether they be, you know, descriptions of operations or, um, or, or budget documents or, or what have you. Um, we obviously dip into, um, uh, you know, satellite imagery is to the extent we can. We rely a lot on it in illustrations. We do less sort of um, technical analysis, if you will, <clears throat> of satellite imagery uh, signals. Um, we, we've done a few things, but it's mainly to illustrate and to, to discover things. Um, so, so we are maybe not as deep in satellite imagery as others, but we certainly use it frequently. Um, and, and, and then, of course, personal contacts are so crucial uh, in this work. And I'm not talking just, you know, friends in the arms control community that work on this, but talking to people that are at all levels of this discussion and this development, uh, whether they be practitioners, theorists, um, intelligence people outside, inside, uh, journalists, um, people on the ground, locals, whatever. It's just very important to run these uh, this data set uh, by people uh, and hear uh, their take on it. Um, and then of course, social media. I mean, you know, obviously social media has always existed, <laughs> um, but it's gotten a lot more advanced and, and, and immensely huge, <laughs> as Trump would say. 
Um, so there's a lot of data out there to crunch, and we're just a small team. I mean, we're a very small team, you know, a couple of people going through this on a regular basis, trying to make sense of the data, um, old documents, new documents, what have you. So it's it's not by any means a, a big organization, even though Federation of Americans sounds so big. It's a, it's a very small project, and of course, that also makes it uh, fragile. But just some examples of that is, of course, um, we very much use satellite imagery to, to, to sort of document new developments, glean some technical insight for them, um, but very much to illustrate. <clears throat> we combine that, of course, with uh, document search and, and what have you and, and put it out um, to the extent we think it's accurate. Uh, we learn from our mistakes um, and, uh, you know, move on. So, so through this, we've been able to do some discoveries over the years, and uh, it's been really fun and uh, rewarding. Um, we can also use it to, to, to sort of monitor and very, uh, verify types of uh, uh, forces that are deployed or operating. Uh, you don't normally get the news about what they are. I'm just using one example here from on the picture on the left, which is from a, a B-52 operation, where there are certain ways to identify whether the particular aircraft that's flying is a nuclear capable aircraft, or if it's just another bomber, you know. So that is that is uh, an important way of doing it. You know, uh, schmoozing with people, uh, you know, sleuthing kind of work also enables us to do things like detect when a new system goes out. And we, for example, detect it when the first U.S. low-yield nuclear warhead went on, uh, to sea on board a U.S. ballistic missile submarine uh, late last year, they're, and they're now out on, on, on the subs uh, in both the Pacific and, and the Atlantic. Uh, in Russia, we spend a lot of time using satellite imagery uh, and, of course, uh, open source information to, you know, glean insight into um, their modernization program, the status of it, where is it. Important here is also that there's an enormous uh, volume of information from the past that has just, you know, over years proven very, very important to, to do this kind of work. Um, and ironically, um, this work that we've done has come, uh, you know, in some cases fairly close to what official estimates are. Um, and what we've heard from some people in government is that it enables a, a U.S. government publications sometimes to lean on the kind of work and and sort of spill not their entire intel, but but just say you know up to two thousand non-strategic nuclear weapons, and that's where our estimate has been for a number of years. And so uh, that's another effect of it. This raises another issue, of course, that I'll come back to later here. That you're sort of damned if you do and damned if you don't, because uh, uh, if you you put this information out and and the players in the nuclear arms race, if you will, uh, begin to tag into it and use that as their justification for saying the other guys are really bad and therefore we need some more stuff. You know, you get into this loop here, but there's no way out of this, uh, I think. Uh, I think it's more important to, to document what we find and, 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 and let the data and the information speak for itself. People would use it for whatever purpose uh, they find uh, necessary, of course. We're also trying to find information about new capabilities being built into the systems. For example, as they go through modernizations, here's an example of, you know, one of the silos in, in the Kozelsk missile division uh, in, in Western Russia. And you can just, by looking at the image, look at this enormous difference in the infrastructure for this silo. Um, and, and as the, the base matures in the upper picture, you can see new capabilities. And in this case, we've obviously noticed, as have many other people, uh, the inclusion of, of advanced um, uh, air defense systems uh, to these systems, a reflection of the perspective that these are going to be these going to be targeted not just by nuclear weapons in the future, but by conventional forces. We also combine uh, satellite imagery and, um, and anecdotal uh, evidence, like stories that people in the past told about issues. They told that turn out to be really interesting. And here in the case layer where a former Stratcom commander um, uh, went to a Russian uh, central nuclear weapon storage site um, and after the fact uh, described this in public, um, apparently the intelligence co community wasn't very happy about that, but he did it nonetheless, uh, this described the structure of this internal, uh, uh, and here we have a picture uh, of, of what's going on now at that storage site, how it's being uh, excavated and they're trying to uh, upgrade and, and modernize uh, the, the storage site. Um, on the Chinese side, of course, uh, monitoring um, where 
uh, systems go in. China is so hugely interesting because it used to be this very, very um, opaque, dark spot on, on, on the map uh, where it was very hard to get information unless it came from people that leaked something. Um, since uh, Google Earth uh, came about, um, it's been extraordinary. I would also add cell phones for that matter. <laughs> but certainly Google Earth has been an amazing trip. Um, there are so many really, really good people today who are just combing um, uh, these um, areas to look for systems and developments. And, and so that is just sort of a very uh, potent development. I mean, it's unbelievable how much is going on in this one. And there's some you know, uh, really, really good analysts over the last few years that have just done pioneering work on this stuff. Uh, you know, we can get to back to their names, but they're, it, it's really unique to see. Uh, our work has been, for example, to discover a missile training site up in the northern side of, uh, you know, China, northern central side, outline it and describe, you know, the infrastructure, new developments, try to geolocate, all these types of stuff. Um, and so, we have even, you know, gone in there and looked at where particular launch events have happened, been able to use, um, uh, you know, geographic features, uh, plant, you know, plant uh, distribution during different seasons to hone in on when the, the particular test happened, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that's been a, a very fun exercise. We look at, we look at what kind of uh, launchers are roaming around in this area, and we compare the, the visuals of these launchers on the satellites with what are displayed during parades to, to sort of, you know, get better at discovering these particular um, capabilities when they're operating in, in, in the landscape. Um, we're also discovering new things, uh, such as uh, work on silos in China. Um, and again, just like previously, um, with, with Russia, um, this also found its way into the Department of Defense report, the latest one. Um, and, and again, you know, it gives you sort of a, an interesting taste in the mouth because, you know, of course, it, it's part of the arms competition as well. Um, but um, that's part of discovering stuff. Um, we're also looking at satellite imagery, imagery in the sense of the challenge of getting around the variety of different forms of commercial satellite imagery over the years when you compare with things. And, and here to the left is just an illustration uh, of a base in the Netherlands where even when we purchased imagery from the company uh, that you know, commercially sold these things, we discovered that they had, you know, they had manipulated the imagery. And, um, and, and, and so to, to mask out a, a, new, a nuclear weapons or a former nuclear weapons story, it wasn't, it wasn't even a current nuclear weapons story, a former. Um, but, but you sometimes bump into these things and you have to be really careful when you use it. It's not given because you buy a commercial satellite imagery that therefore what you see is what you think you see. We're also, uh, of course, using uh, this type of work um, uh, to kick back on sort of silly secrecy, both in terms of this, uh, but in terms of this image as it illustrates, but also in terms of when policies change. And of course, a recent development is that the Trump administration uh, decided to discontinue the, uh, the the disclosure of the size of the U.S. nuclear weapons stockpile. Um, you know, we've been pushing for that disclosure for many, many years, and we're still pushing. But right now, um, they closed the door. Um, that happens on other issues, submarine operations, what have you. You know, it's it's a it's a trend uh, under this administration. So hopefully, some of that will change uh, in the future. So just some broad lessons from this, of course. Um, that it's just so vital we find out over the years, and this is a no brainer, of course, to have a very broad array of, of sources that you use for this. Um, and, and like it's been mentioned before, start from the original sources. This is one of the biggest problem of the internet, um, a curse of the internet, literally, that it is so easy to spread misinformation and disinformation, and, and uh, even by people who think they're not. And, um, and once they find their way into the headlines, it can be extraordinarily difficult to, to clear it out. Um, and, 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 and we see very um, respectable organizations today with sort of overview of, of nuclear forces on their websites that just have really wrong information uh, for which there's no basis. And, and once you start going back and, and, and tracking the sources, 
um, you get to some really bad sources. So that's just to say, you know, duh, be really careful here. Um, the importance of this, like I mentioned, it can help reduce official secrecy and sort of the compartmental secrecy and actually allow governments to open up. Of course, to some extent, there's a huge difference between different countries also. The United States is extraordinarily uh, uh, open about its nuclear uh, capabilities compared to other countries. Russia says very little. There were some statements after the end of the Cold War, but it's basically very opaque, although it does give a lot of briefings about now it's doing this and updating this facility and what have you. China also saying very, very little about what they have. But again, China has also evolved uh, tremendously in terms of they like to showcase what they have. And when you showcase, well, you show videos. Some of those videos might actually be authentic. Others may be quite a mix of different types of sources and, and events and, and what have you. So be extraordinarily difficult and, and you have to be really careful about it. And then of course, the other issue is that you know, educating a growing up people, so to speak, in this field just takes a long time. Um, you know, you know, on our issue here, tracking nuclear arsenals around the world, you have to have a memory bank that's that's enormous uh, to be able to quickly see what's going on. Otherwise, you're you're led down pathways that lead to nowhere or somewhere wrong. Um, so that's that's just really important that not only that you can do that, but also that funders. Um, value this and actually sustain this type of operation uh, for a long time. So you have the time to educate people to do this. And not least, uh, building archives, databases from day one, be organized, do it, you know, it, you'll love it later on. <laughs> so, and of course, that can always improve and, and, and that's a never ending job. For a, a couple of people we are working on this, this project, this is just like an enormous uh, task compared to just following what's going on. Um, and again, I said funding is scarce and, uh, and it's a challenge. Again, um, we've been lucky over the Trump administration. Trump has been good for us. <laughs> um, I'm sure we're going to have a hard time when, when things change again. But so it fluctuates enormously. That gives an enormous uncertainty uh, in how you can structure and plan your future work. And that is the big um, uh, minus, I think, in funding strategies by a lot of uh, organizations. We have many funders, big funders that have uh, supported um, us and many others. And then suddenly they get a new leadership and they're thrown into yet another strategic review of what should we work on and how should we do it? And suddenly everything is up in the air. So there's, there are all these factors that are going on. We don't have taxpayers who just give us money <laughs> all the time. Um, and of course, collaboration, essential, valuable, um, you can't do without it. Lean on others, uh, run data by other people. You really have to do that. Um, and of course, but it can also be a challenge um, because of there's so much competition going on, ironically, in this um, work. Um, I, I call it turf here, but you know, people find discoveries and, and they want to get credit for discoveries. They want, just want to, don't want to just pass them on to someone else or it disappears into someone's database or what have you. So there is an element of that as well. Um, but again, Please, please, please train the next generation for this kind of work. I know you, the other organizations that are represented here doing a fantastic work on doing that. For us, it's a challenge, but it's something for this particular kind of work we do, but it's something uh, we're, we're actively engaged in with my, my new assistant here, uh, Matt Corder, who's a really bright cookie. And so uh, people like that need to be brought up, young people um, for different kinds of backgrounds to, to be able that we have to, to be able to be sure we have these kind of capabilities in the future. So anyway, I've babbled too long and uh, I'll just um, leave it at that for now. Hans, thank you so much. Uh, you know, I've used your numbers. I relied on your analyses forever. <laughs> and it's really exciting to hear you speak about where you get them from. Um, and also the sense that, you know, you, you've given us a snapshot of verification before the age of Google and, and now how the new OSINT style tools are making a difference to your work. Um, before handing over to Ben, I'm just going to say, you know, it, it's again a really good reminder that a, re a, a really useful part of open source research is the sense that it can correct misinformation. It's hard, <laughs> but yeah. it can do that. And also this really interesting insight you gave us about the institutional memory is really important that, that you don't just get to be able to do this, this stuff very quickly. Um, and one thing that open source organizations can do is store the stuff, which, which sounds very similar 
to the talks we've had about data loss uh, it, it, by previous speakers. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm now going to hand over to Benjamin Strick. I notice we've got questions coming in, so please, all panelists, do keep your eye on those and be ready to answer them after Ben's talk. Yeah. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Henrietta, and thanks to the other panelists as well. I'm actually really honoured to be here. A um, little bit nervous as well because there's a lot of very professional people in this room, but yeah, I'll give it a crack anyway. Um, okay, cool. So here's my presentation. Um, so basically what I wanted to do is just make a little brief slideshow on uh, visual analysis and answering questions. Um, Alan's gone through a lot. Uh, everyone else has gone through a lot. And so I just wanted to really dive down into some specific case studies and, and, and show you um, how some of this works. So a little bit about me. My name is Ben. Um, and I'm an open source investigator with the BBC at the moment. I'm a contributor at Bellingcat. I run a project, uh, or lead trainer for a project called the EU Arms Project, where we document breaches of arms export licenses in, in, in regards to the common position uh, for EU countries. Um, and I, I've got a very different background. I don't have a background in intelligence or a very rich resource intelligence background. A lot of this is self-taught. And um, as Melissa said before, a uh, uh, Google Earth uh, educated as well because it's free. and um, I don't have to pay for it. Uh, so I just thought I'd put this slide on here. Um, I do often have a lot of conflict images uh, in my slideshows. And so I just wanted to pop this in here. Um, there will be a couple of things. I'll, I'll warn you before they come up um, in this presentation if there's any graphic content. So a little bit about what I do at BBC Africa Eye. Uh, I'm part of a team. We're an open source investigative unit. And so we've done some pretty popular titles and, and really good investigations into some horrible things that have happened in Africa. Um, so for one of them, for instance, is the murder or the execution of two women and two children, uh, which was said to be in Mali or to be in Nigeria. We actually found it to be in Cameroon just by geolocating this mountain set, this, this ridge line that you can see here um, and other things like that. And uh, going through, we've done some work on Sudan when there was a massacre on June 3rd as well. We were able to tell exactly who did the attack, exactly when it happened. And as you can see, a common theme in this stuff is using satellite imagery. Now, more relevant to what we're talking about today, I've also been able to identify Turkish ghost ships delivering weapons packages into Libya in breach of the UN arms embargo. And we've been able to use a lot of satellite imagery to really show what's on the ground as well. So it's helped uh, because, you know, a lot of these times people are trying to hide their activities and all that sort of stuff. And so we've been able to identify videos like this that were filmed on board a Turkish vessel with huge weapon systems, ACV-15s, GDFs, Corkets as well, which many of you might be familiar with. And we've been able to sort of do things like these visual forensics um, and bring them together. Another piece of research that I focus on a lot is about influence. Um, and, and this is something that's dangerous to us all because it infects the information that we get offline. Um, so Alan was talking about going to the first source, but sometimes the first source might actually be provided by a bot network, like this one in West Papua, which was ran from an Indonesian marketing firm. And this massive Chinese network that I busted last year as well, that was targeting activists in Hong Kong. And this one also, which is using um, AI generated profile pictures, uh, a more recent one. But what I want to talk to you today about is um, looking at the Wing Lung 2 in Libya and how we attributed that to the UAE and some specific questions that weren't available online and how we found those. Um, so this is a graphic image. It's CCTV footage filmed in Tripoli uh, from a military, uh, uh, like a small recruit academy. In this, we can see when the, when the young recruits turn and march, and then there's a flash of light and a lot of them are dead on the ground. Um, this was a targeted strike. Uh, a lot of people said it was the UAE, but again, as, as Alan said in his, uh, in his framework approach, we really need to ignore that information and have a look at what the facts are on the ground. We could have said, yes, this is UAE, or it could have been Turkey, but we didn't have that proof. So we started digging for it. Um, so obviously looking at where the academy is, looking at where Tripoli is, just to give you a bit of an overview, this is where the GNA is, this is where the LNA is in the red area. So we've got two conflicts that are going on here, just in case if you don't know about Libya, but you probably do being in this, in this seminar right here. 
So one of the first things that we started with was just having a look at the shrapnel on the ground that was collected on the day. We can start to sort of have a look at that stuff. We got access to that um, shrapnel through a, 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 a citizen or, or, or someone that we, that we worked with in Tripoli. And so we can see this table full of shrapnel. We piece that together. We, made, we, we found that all of this shrapnel pieced together is a rocket system called the Blue Arrow 7. Now that's a Chinese made surface uh, air to ground missile system. So this is quite interesting because in UN reports looked at previously and just from common knowledge and, and, and having a look at what type of weapon systems or what type of vehicles would use this bomb uh, or, or this missile system, we know that it's fired by a wing loom too. And that's been included in, in UN reports already. So we had numerous amounts of evidence to attribute this to a wing loom too, but not the UAE. So going through satellite imagery of air bases in Libya, we're able to look at one specific air base. We actually looked at all of them, but I'm not gonna go through all of them today. Uh, but this is one specific air base uh, called Al Khadim, which is in, in the Eastern side of Libya near Benghazi. And we can see wing looms on satellite imagery. We know these are wing looms because we can measure their width and length on Google Earth um, and narrow that down to not being any other drone but the wing loom with the exact measurements of that as well. And we use high, uh, high resolution imagery for that too. So how did we know that this base was controlled by the UAE? We looked at all of the weapon systems that we could get on satellite imagery. Black Hawks, wing looms, AT-802 air tractors, which are refurbished, and Hawk surface-to-air missile systems. Who owns all these? Cool, we've got the UAE. Great, so we knew that they were in control of this. We also had a look at registries, um, which is what someone hinted to before at about the Cipri arms registry. We had a look at that and we can see that UAE purchased these. But there's a couple of problems with this investigation that I'll get to next. Um, so we started to have a look at, okay, who knows what a wing loom package actually looks like? Because if we go to arms expos and I contacted friends that do go to arms expos all the time and take little photos of the, of the, of the places when, when the wing loom is displayed, what comes in a wing loom package? What, what does it look like when you buy it? Does it come in a box? Does it come with anything else? Obviously China doesn't want us to know this. So we have to start going through really alternative footage like this report from 2006, 2007. It's a journalist walking through talking about how proud they are of this new drone that is being sold around the world called a Wing Loon. So she's going through the control center and talking about it. So what we did was we got a satellite image from that exact day at that exact same location of when it was being filmed. And what we can do here is start to identify, okay, what are the core components that are sold with a wing loom? Okay, she points to this satellite data system right here. We we're, were able to measure that one and we can see the little box on that. And this one, which is the pilot's room. Okay, now we've found out that every wing loom center, even the ones that we can see in the desert here in this base, all come with this little pilot control center and this little satellite data, data center. We couldn't find any of that information on Google whatsoever. So we're starting to bring these things together. What else can we find out about that that we didn't know before? So for instance, these little boxes here. So now we know after doing this research that when you buy a wing loom, it comes like a product from Ikea, it comes flat packed. We found that out because we dived through Chinese state backed agencies and having a look at promotional videos about the wing loom. And we found this one. So what they do is when they pack up the wing loom for shipping, they fold the wings on the side and they have the core components at the nose and they put it in a little flat pack box. And that's what we can see here. And we can also rule that, um, we, we can also further provide that evidence by having a look at when these things actually moved from Libya to Egypt. We can count the exact same boxes and the exact style of boxes. And they moved across uh, just recently, earlier this year, they moved from Libya to Egypt. And we can see that on satellite imagery um, as well. So we know that those are the, the wing loom containers there. Um, so what I'll do is I'll make a new screen share here. Uh, and I wanna take you through to Google Earth because that gives us extra information. So revisiting a site called um, Al Jufra, which is a popular airbase in Libya, we're able to find some interesting things. So. This is one of the bases where wing looms have been rumored to, 
um, be present. And we, it's not rumored because we can prove that through satellite imagery. Um, if I scroll through my little timeline here, um, Henrietta, is that Google Earth showing? That's working, right? Yes, yes, I can oh, see great. it. Great, yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Cool, so what we have here is a little wing loon present there. And of course, I can just measure his, um, his wings to see that, to see that it's actually him. Okay, cool. So that's our little wing loon. What we can tell is that when those wing loons were present in our Jufra, this little station popped up here. And what we have is the exact, and that also left after a bombing in our Jufra as well. And so what we have is we're able to identify, okay, usually the UAE would hide their wing loons in, in a little air base, in a little uh, uh, area, protected area like this. But there's one place that we know that is a definite sign of wing loons, and that is now these little sort of installations that we're just able to identify by having a look at Chinese media reports and by cross-referencing that with satellite imagery. And now when we rule these out and we take their dimensions, we can confirm that that's the exact composition of what a component would be uh, when it's sold from the wing loon. Um, so that's all I've got to show you in a very brief amount of time. Um, and if there's any questions, I know I sort of really rushed through that very quickly as an encapsulated diagram of what wing loon two systems look like and the, the whole war of Libya. But yeah, if there's any questions, please follow, please follow through. Ben, it was absolutely astonishing what you managed to whistle through <laughs> in that in that short time frame. I'm I'm really fascinated by it. You gave a really deep sense of the sort of work that you do is not about uh, quick fix shopping lists of ticks things that you can tick off a list. That there's a real craft involved in open source research, not least how you know what you're looking for. You might not be looking for the thing that you're looking for, that you're you start looking for components and you have to look for clues and different sorts of evidence. Really, really fascinating. Thank you. So we have seven minutes left uh, for questions, everybody. <laughs> uh, so thank you. We have got some questions in. Uh, we've got several uh, for Melissa, one for Hans and two general ones. So what I'm gonna do uh, is I'm going to read them out and give you each a turn to answer your bits and reflect on more widely. And uh, if there is time, I will invite the audience to, to respond, but there may well not be. So Melissa, uh, in, in order, uh, in fact, this, this question is from Dan Plesch, uh, who's, who's just bobbed up in Speak of You. Dan, do you, do you very quickly want to say it? <laughs> oh, I thought, I would, well, yes, you, you said yes and then not. Um, okay. First of all, uh, this series has been absolutely fascinating and very productive, and it's been brilliant to see people coming in from very different um, areas of, of work uh, into uh, what seems to be uh, building an epistemic community. Uh, and I've been blown away by the quality of some of the, uh, the presentations. But very quickly, one of the motivations behind our, the, our project is that while, while a very large part of the world thinks it's desirable and practical to manage the world's industrial systems to tackle climate change, and thinks that's a, um, a viable thing to do and an essential thing to do, uh, that broadly those same communities uh, see the global monitoring of weapons as just too hard to think about. Uh, and going back to you know, experiences in arms control 20, 30 years ago, it's always seemed to us that actually it's more feasible than people think it is. And uh, these presentations, I think, only reinforce that. So the, the larger technical question is, if we're starting to think about what a global weapons management system might be, if you like, a globalized version of the CFE, CSBM agreements of 1990s in the OSCE, how scalable are, is the sort of work that um, Melissa and, and Hans and, and Ben, um, uh, how scalable might that be to deal with the general purpose forces of the world's arm, armies, navies and air forces, which, um, is I think the sort of 800 pound gorilla in all of this. We're looking at the micro level and we look at the macro level uh, of WMD, but this huge uh, area in between gets almost no attention from NGOs and funders and governments. Great, thank you, Dan. Adding to that, uh, a question for Melissa uh, was, uh, 
uh, how do you, how does, could you say anything more about how Deteo stores the evidence uh, that from Dan Liu uh, there? Um, and also a question uh, from somebody who's now left, I'm afraid, but asking how quick, how frequently you update uh, the uh, imagery on Deteo's site. Um, we had a question specifically for Hans, uh, if you could say anything more, say anything about the deployment of Russian nuclear forces please. And then some uh, a specific question for Ben as well that's just come in um, about if if you if you think that uh, states might start taking measures to evade open source research, the more they know about it and the more prevalent it becomes. And then two general questions that I want all the panelists to think about. Um, in again from Dan L, um, when thinking about the professionalization uh, of, of the whole field, do we think in terms of one community of practice, one set of professional standards, one ethical code, or are there multiple? Uh, and Paul Schultz asked a question about uh, what, what's the evidence for what sort of data sets are the most influential and the most useful here? So I'm very sorry, I've kind of gone through those very quickly. <laughs> uh, time's really ticking. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Melissa, uh, please to respond first, and I will ask you in the order that you've spoken, uh, so you can be preparing your questions. Yeah, thank you, Melissa. Thank you for the questions, and um, you can follow me on Twitter and send me a direct message at mhannam if you if if I don't answer them all. Um, I think the tools we have in detail are imperfect, but getting better, and they are definitely scalable. Our constraints are the data because we're collecting data uh, outside the world and bringing it in and we have a finite budget. Um, so the data we put on there is our mission and it may not be yours. Um, very interested in cost sharing and other opportunities for lowering that. Um, the data we get in uh, comes in the format that the company uh, delivers it to us. So for example, Maxar data is daily, but it may be two or three days behind the current date because it takes a while to get downlinked. Uh, we do build bots. Um, typically they, they collect however often we believe the data to be updated. So if it's a news source or a government page that is updated daily, then we collect daily. Um, our storage is Amazon Web Services and storage really hasn't been a cost factor. It's getting cheaper and cheaper. It's the processing power that does start to add up and get expensive. So when you click a button and you think you're getting, you know, often we'll be like, if this takes a few minutes, there's like um, a computer server farm in Iceland that's just like um, dealing with all that data. That's where the expense adds up. So to the extent we can pre-clean and vet the data for those computations to be simpler later, we do that. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out on Twitter. I just wonder, Melissa, if you had anything to comment about Dan's, Dan Plesh's question about scalability of, of the tools that you do, that you, that you use? Yeah, so um, imagery, text analysis, all of those kinds of things I think are pretty useful. I did a training of the OSCE, um, I wanna say a month ago on using uh, natural language processing. Um, I think there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, it's really a case of political will. Um, many governments and international organizations who have had the chance to look at Deteo say, yes, this is really great but we don't want to operate in the public. We want our own siloed version of Deteo where only we look at this information, which is their right and their option and makes sense. Um, but it does mean you lose that expertise and diversity from the rest of the world. Great, thank you very much, uh, Melissa. So uh, moving to Alan, would you, do you have any comments about these questions uh, generally put? <clears throat> so I'll ask the one actually on those who said uh, how what information becomes more credible, how to make it more credible. I suppose it's when you go into things like uh, when Benjamin did his analysis behind it. If you can prove beyond, like to a very high high degree of actually you've done the analysis behind it, you can the, the information's there. You can prove the information. It's just when you've just got one post that has no, no nothing, no analysis behind it. 
is actually is easily debunked, classed as fake news. It's it's all the all, all the work that goes behind it that actually can, can prove analysis and, and prove your judgment. Great, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I think that was answering Paul's question about what evidence is most influential in, in practice. and practice. And what you're saying is it's the process of giving the information you collect some credibility, the, the, the greater credibility. So that could be, it's not, the question is not really about the data, the sort of data you're getting, it's about the, what you do with it, how you crunch it and, and giving it a value added qu uh, quality. Yeah, thank yeah. you, uh, Alan, yes. Um, Hans, I'm gonna move on to you then. Okay. Okay, um, let me just. And I must share. say, I must just to uh, just to interject. I, I misrepresented the question uh, for That's you. Okay. Uh, yeah, did you did you read the clarification? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah thank I you. Yeah. So yeah. let me just let me just share my screen while I answer the question. So the question is about uh, uh, whether Russia has nuclear, or or to what extent it has nuclear weapons in the Kaliningrad region, and of course we don't know. <laughs> um, all we can say. Um, is that yes, they have lots of uh, weapon systems that can, that are capable of delivering nuclear warheads. Um, but whether they have the warheads for those delivery systems in that region as well is, is, is hard to say based on open source information. But you can see there's some important developments going on, for example, here with an upgrade of what uh, clearly seems to be a nuclear weapon storage site um, north of the city of Kaliningrad. Um, this has been going on for the last several years, and I think they're, you know, just about done with this, uh, the bigger of the, uh, the bunkers. Um, and so, of course, this doesn't prove that there is or is not nuclear warheads in Kaliningrad. Um, you need other information to do that, but it shows that this site is active uh, and is being maintained and apparently being upgraded. So at least they want to send a message about capability or what have you. Um, but what I hear from, from U.S. Uh, officials is that Yes, there are several uh, nuclear capable systems in Kaliningrad, but they have not detected a uh, movement of nuclear warheads into that region yet. They're further stored further back in inside uh, main Russia. Thank you. Um, uh, do you have any comments about the other questions as well, Hans? Uh, and in well, particular, Dan. Dan yeah, the one about scalability. About yeah, the one about scalability, of course, is 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 theoretically possible. Um, but I think um, the, the real crunch for just speaking for ourselves is, of course, is the amount of resources available to do this work, and that this this is what it comes down to. I mean, we are in a way suffering under the same predicament as as the intelligence community does. That it's very easy theoretically to collect a lot of data and store a lot of data and you know and present a lot of data and all that kind of stuff. What takes time is to look at it and pick what is most relevant and make the, the, the right conclusions about it. That takes analysis. Um, and in the, in the end, it might you know, take people, <laughs> obviously, to be able to make those uh, decisions. And that takes, that takes personnel. And so this is a real uh, dilemma. Um, so for example, for our part, that has been a contributing factor to forcing us to limit ourselves actually to not look at broader defense issues, but just focus on the nuclear part of it. But we just don't have the capacity to do that. That's really interesting. It's really interesting to hear theoretically, it would be possible to do more global weapons tracking or more tra tracking generally, but the hard limit comes from, uh, from how, how many how many people hours you've got and so it's quite good to be able to draw limits to to be able to do what you do uh, really well um in in case it's not clear to everybody uh, nathaniel raymond had to go because he had teaching commitment so we're not we're not hearing back from him so in the final point uh, i'm uh, handing over to benjamin strick to uh, comment uh, on these questions and we had a similar question to the one that came in to you about if if these sorts of measures are available by states uh, Paul, Paul Schulter sent, sent a follow-up question saying, shouldn't we expect uh, states to just start hiding things in big boxes? Uh, so over to you, Ben. Um, yeah, awesome questions, guys. So first of all, on, on the countermeasures, I mean, this is not new stuff. Bellingcat is not doing new stuff and none of us are doing new stuff because the enemy always has a, a, an intelligence room full of analysts, 10,000 of me and, and 10,000 times the size of Bellingcat looking at satellite imagery all day long as a job. 
And these, you know, I mean, the Israelis have, have some of the most autistic people staring at Google Earth 24 seven, mapping out every single thing. This is not new stuff. I think what is new is um, some of the bad press that some of the military get because it, now it's not intelligence, it's the media doing it. And so for instance, Russia has now sent out, well, did a couple of years ago, sent out a, a, a communique essentially to their superior officers in the military saying, stop your, your soldiers from recording uploading, things like that. And I'm sure the UAE have done the same thing for people in Libya, you know, stop taking selfies at Al Jufra because otherwise Ben's gonna find it. Um, you know, so it's simple things like that. I also think, um, you know, as, as time, as technology progresses as well, they're finding new ways of hiding bunkers. Um, so for instance, uh, there, there's a Tur new Turkish airstrip in the middle of Tripoli that's built in a residential district, essentially. It's just a smack bang uh, airstrip and, and the way to hide their their vehicles is by hiding them under the unused apartment blocks rather than having bunkers that are hidden and camouflaged. Of course, this bunker, what else is going to hide? It's not going to hide the McDonald's. Um, I think the next thing is probably uh, one thing that's coming across a lot is commercial contracts for satellite providers as well. Um, this is a very touchy topic, um, especially coming from journalism as well. Obviously, if you're a satellite provider and you have UAEs as, as, a, as a, a contractor, um, you're not going to provide too much satellite imagery to NGO groups or public groups that want to investigate war crimes in Libya about UAE. Um, so there's, there's interesting situations like that that are going to be a turn point later that may be um, indirectly assisting the enemy. Um, and I'm not going to call them the enemy, but just documentation of, of, of um, horrible uh, things as well. Um, for Paul's question about evidence, I think that's a really good question. And, and, and the issue is with OSINT or open source research growing is that it's becoming a bit of a trend as well. People hop on Twitter and they like to screenshot Google Earth and be the first one to identify this or that or this. But oftentimes the, the rush to get that information out is uh, sacrifices, attribution and accountability and proper documentation. Um, and I think there needs to be a, a, a trend to be, hey, it's cool if you can find something, but find it in the right way and do it in a, in a research mentality, not a, hey, I want to be the first journalist to report this thing, um, because that's that's an issue that will kill the industry and, and will give open source a very, very bad name. Um, and for scalability, I mean, the biggest qualm that I see with scalability is, is the collaboration of the communities. Um, there are a lot of groups out there that want to be the first to get their brand name ahead of the thing or to be in charge of, hey, I'm the person that found this or we're the group of people that found that. And they don't necessarily like sitting in the same room and sharing that, that reputation. Um, I think if everyone was to come in with a complete community, mind, community mindset and to be able to approach this and say, hey, we're all doing the same thing. We're all trying to keep accountability. Let's do it together. Sacrifice ego and do good work about documentation of North Korea, documentation of human rights abuses in Africa and things like that. Um, but if you want to uh, uh, respond to me and send me hate messages or anything like that, I'm on Ben Du Brown at Twitter. Ben, thank you very much. Uh, and I'm sure uh, that's unlikely <laughs> uh, that anybody's going to be sending you hate messages. Really, really fantastic. And, um, you know, I'm sure we've all got a flavour that we could have gone on for a long time, much longer with these questions. And uh, I'm sorry it's so rushed. I think you brought us back full circle. The sense that uh, open source can do a whole bunch of stuff but there are uh, challenges to professionalization. Um, and that brings us back to Dan L's uh, question about, is it one community of practice? Do we need multiple ethical codes? I invite you to look again at Melissa's. Uh, she, she invited comments on the Detaios code of practice and the ethics uh, that they've written. Um, and I do hope we can keep this conversation going. Um, uh, thank you so much. What amazing speakers we've had today, what amazing uh, questions we've had, and not just today, over the full uh, seven webinars, uh, it has been amazing, the, the conversations we've had. Um, please do save the date of our virtual cafe if that's something that interests you, and please do uh, watch out for other things that we're doing. The date of the virtual cafe is the 10th of December. Um, so it's just now time to say goodbye to everybody uh thank you again um and hope that we see you soon yeah bye bye <laughs>